Welcome to Friday in the octave of Easter. And so this Sunday, we celebrate Easter Sunday, the eighth day. We celebrate Easter Sunday. Easter Sunday is celebrated in eight days, including this Sunday. So we celebrate the Sunday in the octave of Easter. That's what we're doing here on Sunday. But here we are in the middle of the octave Friday, in the middle of the octave. Glad you could join us once again. Really interesting readings. And the, you know, always pay attention to that, the first reading too, because as you can see, the disciples are doing the exact same things that Jesus did. And I'm sorry I'm not wearing my black stuff here today. Just didn't have it on. I got over here, I forgot I didn't have it on. So I just thought, here we go. So uh, let's begin. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Lord be with you. Wow, we have these awesome readings and Jesus alive and just wants to offer you this forgiveness that's always there for us. Let's open the gift and ask him for his mercy. Lord Jesus, you did suffer and die for us. Lord, have mercy. You rose from the dead. Christ, have mercy. You're present here among us. Lord, have mercy. May Almighty God have mercy on us, forgive us our sins, and bring us to everlasting life. Amen. Let us pray. Almighty and ever-living God, who gave us the paschal mystery of in the covenant you've established for reconciling human race, so dispose our minds, we pray, that what we celebrate by professing the faith, we may express in deeds through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, God, forever and ever. Amen. A reading from the Acts of the Apostles. 
After the crippled man had been cured, while Peter and John were still speaking to the people, the priest, the captain of the temple guard, and the Sadducees confronted them, disturbed that they were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection of the dead. They laid hands on Peter and John and put them in custody until the next day, since it was already evening. But many of those who heard the word came to believe, and the number of men grew to about 5,000. On the next day, their leaders, elders, and scribes were assembled in Jerusalem with Annas the high priest, Caiaphas, John, Alexander, and all who were of high priestly class. They brought them into their presence and questioned them, By what power or by what name have you done this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, answered them, Leaders of the people and elders, if we are being examined today about a good deed done to a cripple, namely by what means he was saved, then all of you and all the people of Israel should know that it was in the name of Jesus Christ, the Nazarene, who you crucified, whom God raised from the dead. In his name, this man stands before you healed. He is the stone rejected by you, the builders, which has become the cornerstone. There is no salvation through anyone else, nor is there any other name under heaven given to the human race by which we are to be saved. The word of the Lord. This is the day that the Lord has acted. We will rejoice and be glad. The stone that the builders said all rejected has become the rock where we stand. The Lord is my strength. Resound in the house, resound in the house of the righteous. He's done mighty things. He's done mighty things. This is the day that the Lord has acted. We will rejoice and be glad. The stone that the builders had all rejected has become the rock. be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to John. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus revealed himself again to his disciples on the Sea of Tiberias. He revealed himself in this way, together with Simon, Peter, Thomas, called Didymus, Nathaniel from Cana in Galilee, Zebedee's sons, and two others of his disciples. Simon Peter said to them, I am going fishing. They said to him, we also will go with you. So they went. They went out and got in the boat. And that night they caught nothing. 
When it was already dawn, Jesus was standing on the shore, but the disciples did not realize that it was Jesus, as oftentimes is the case. Jesus said to them, children, have you caught anything to eat? And they answered him, no. So he said to them, cast the net over on the right side of the boat and you will find something. So they cast it and were not able to pull it in because of the number of fish. So the disciples, whom, the disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, it is the Lord. When Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he tucked in his garment, for he was lightly clad, and jumped into the sea. The other disciples came in the boat, for they were not far from shore, only about a hundred yards, dragging the net of the fish. When they climbed out on shore, they saw a charcoal fire, charcoal fire again, with fish on it and bread. Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish you have caught. So Simon Peter went over and dragged the net ashore full of 153 large fish. Even though there were so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, come, have breakfast. None of the disciples dared to ask him, who are you? Because they realized it was the Lord. Jesus came over and took the bread and gave it to them and like the man, in a like manner, the fish. This is now the third time Jesus had revealed to his disciples after being raised from the dead. The gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Again, hope you're paying attention to the, uh, uh, um, to the first reading. It's just as beautiful as the gospel is. But we've been talking about these appearances, and I hope you're kind of getting these appearances a little bit and how they all work, recognizing, not recognizing, uh, touching, not touching, eating, not eating, all those different things that are kind of going on here. And here we're reading from the epilogue of the Gospel of John. Now, Every scripture scholar agrees that the end of the Gospel of John, which is the ending for the uh, Gospel this Sunday, is the end of chapter 20. Let me just read it to you. Uh, now, Jesus did many other signs in the, pres uh, in the presence of his disciples that are not written in this book, but these are written so you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through this belief you may have life in his name. Perfect ending, right? Then we have chapter 21 which is today's gospel, this appearance in this chapter 21. And I want to mention two interesting parts about all this. First of all, isn't it interesting they decide to go fishing? I mean, this event, something like this, happened in Luke's gospel at the very beginning of Jesus' ministry. Here it is at the end, and they're going fishing. And he doesn't explain why. I mean, John never explains why they're doing all this. But they do. Jesus sees them, and they bring in 153 fish. Why, oh, why would they count that? Why, why, why would John include that? And, and as uh, Jerry one time said, no throwaway lines in John's gospel. Well, that's how many species of fish they believed were in all of the seas. So this is, this is another symbolic expression of bringing in all the fish, all the people to know this good news of Jesus Christ. And one day, they all will. And the second part of all this I want to share with you is this beloved disciple again is here, and he is the one who recognizes Jesus first. He always is the one who recognizes Jesus first. Before Peter, he's always the one who's kind of telling Peter what's kind of going on here. So, so he's the first one before the leader, and, and everybody recognizes that Peter's the leader here. This disciple who Jesus loved always sees Jesus, recognizes, excuse me, recognizes Jesus first. What's going on here with all this? Happens over and over. It's not to challenge Peter's leadership at all, but it's trying to say that this personal, the side that knows the personal relationship with, with Jesus, and as I've said before, this personal relationship with Jesus in, in John's gospel is, is uh, talked about as the mystical side. This really working, of God, God isn't working like this anymore. He's working from here. He's coming from here out into our lives. And so this person, the mystical, the personal, always recognizes the Lord first. Always recognize, recognizes the Lord before the practical, the institutional, the political, and the administrative part. Now, in the scriptures, it's John who recognizes Peter first. I want to say to you, let's foster this beloved disciple part of our own interior life. So we can kind of grow in this and recognize Jesus first. Now, Father Demetrius says very briefly this. He says, 
The clear implication of all this is that administrative leaders in the church on all levels should pay attention to the insights of those who are mystically attuned to the ways of the Spirit. Or better, perhaps better, they should pay attention to the mystical side of their own personalities. I mean, let's get in touch with this deeper part. Maybe a little bit less FaceTime, you know, and get in touch with this quiet part inside of ourselves. Logic has its value. But it must also make room for spiritual intuition, seeing the Lord as one of those. So let's you and I foster this, uh, uh, this mystical, this personal relationship part of our own relationship with God. Prayer, sacraments, uh, movement, uh, moments of silence in our lives. Um, again, let's put that on the phone. Let's put down, turn the TV off. Let's get some quiet time every single day with your scriptures. I'm always saying over and over again, you got to read the scriptures if you're going to recognize Jesus. That was clear as a bell Wednesday evening or Wednesday whenever we talked about uh, the scriptures from Emmaus. The scriptures are critical to understanding and recognizing Jesus. And then we begin to develop this personal part and this personal part recognizes him in all these different ways he is known to us. A book I've been reading, which which uh, I, I it's kind of one of the go-to books. It's, it's it's really called Abandonment to Divine Providence. But my uh, copy here is The Joy of Full Surrender. It's kind of a modern translation of that book by De Cassade, Abandonment to Divine Providence. The reason I call it The Joy of Full Surrender because uh, sometimes abandonment has a, a negative connotation in our world today, kind of like slavery does. So they, they retranslated it and uh, um, gave it a different title, but this is the book. And I want to share this with you because it's beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. Listen, after the resurrection, Jesus took his disciples by surprise by his very, various appearances. He showed himself to them under forms that they did not recognize and in every act of making himself known to them disappeared from their sight. The same Jesus, ever living, ever working, still surprises. There is not a moment, there is not a moment in which God is not present to us under the cover of some pain to be endured, some obligation or duty to be performed, or some consolation to be endured. The consolation of having gone through the three days. How awesome is that? All that takes place within us, around us, and through us involves and conceals his divine hand. If we lift, if we could lift the veil, and if we were attentive and watchful, God would continually reveal himself to us, and we would see his hand in everything, everything that happens to us, and rejoice in it. At every event, we would exclaim, it is the Lord, like the beloved disciple. God bless you. Looking forward to seeing you this Sunday as we celebrate Easter Day, the eighth day, the Sunday in the octave of Easter. Here's my question for today. Do you, like the beloved disciple, see Jesus in everything that happens to you? God bless you. Looking forward to seeing you very, very soon. Thank you, by the way, for your participation in the Holy Three Days. I, I just thought it was awesome. Just absolutely awesome. I'm so grateful that you were with us and that we can share this good news with you. Goodbye now. See you this weekend. Bye-bye.